So I think what we're going to do is start from where we left off in the methods lecture. I'll try to go through all of these things because these are basically what all of the next exercises are based on. Um, we're going to talk about things like regression, logistic regression, correlation, partial correlation, all of these concepts which are not at all unique to single cell genomics but um, are a part of a lot of the analyses we do in this field. And then we will go back to the hand manual exercises for a little bit and then switch to the um, notebooks. Um, yeah, after that. And that's basically all there is today. So, okay, so we ended on like the rank of a matrix, the, the point that this X, oh, I guess the X disappeared, but the X matrix is a sort of mapping between different spaces. It has some space of outputs that it can give you. Um, and the reason it's sort of useful to think about your data matrix like this in terms of these matrix properties um, is because of how it relates to a lot of different tasks that, that we do. And so I'm going to talk about a linear regression as a, as a sort of common example of this. Um, and also I want to sort of be clear on the notation here. So when you say you regress something on something, the y is the first thing the dependent and then the independent is the x, so you regress y on x. Um, and that's sort of important because you are doing a different thing if you regress x onto y. You're looking for a different relationship. You probably will not get the same model out, especially if you have noisy biological data. And I think this is something that actually has come up a few times that like regressing y equals x of something versus x equals y of something is not the same thing. But there tends to be sort of confusion over that or what that means. So. We'll get into some examples of that, like if you transpose your cell by gene matrix, for example, and treat the observations and features differently, that means a different thing and can be more or less useful depending on the task you want to do. Um, yeah, and so what you're trying to do is sort of fit the best linear relationship, at least in this case, between your y and x, the dependent and the independent variable. Um, yeah, and so this actually came up earlier, but a lot of times in single cell genomics and in a lot of fields, so there's sort of math versus statistics notation of how you label a matrix. And so in this case, your X matrix is um, usually cells on the rows, genes on the Y axis. And this is like your cells are observations of the features. So each gene, there's like a bunch of cell observations. You don't have to necessarily treat the genes as the features, but this is sort of the most common practice. This is like how we do it. Um, this could also be, genes could be measurements of things like position, velocity, different features, and then you have many measurements of those over in different systems. Who knows what it is? It could be whatever Y features you're measuring. Um, yeah, and so, for the purposes of linear regression, this is sort of the relationship we're looking at. So some y is some function of uh, x, your data matrix. And let's see if I give, um, oops, sorry. Um, you want to find some beta coefficients, uh, vector values, which gives you this relationship between x and y. And this could be a lot of things, so an example could be from the expression, you're trying to predict a, a expression of a protein, or you're trying to predict a cell type that the cell belongs to, um, and that would be your y. So there are various different things that could be the y, continuous and discrete, whatever, some phenotype you're interested in predicting. Um, and so what's interesting is that you can think of this problem in terms of what we just talked about, so like the rank, the column space of a matrix. Um, and so X is that matrix, your um, design matrix, your, your counts. And so this like plain rectangle is sort of all the possible X beta um, outputs, the outputs of X times beta. And basically what you're trying to do in least squares optimization, which is like the main method for solving a linear regression problem, is find that beta hat, which basically minimizes this error vector, this vertical error vector um, between the y, which is your um, observed sort of dependent variable, 
and uh, times x. So it's this vertical vector here, which is that, which is uh, also defined as the magnitude of x b minus y. And so you're trying to minimize that by finding beta hat. And for example, if y is literally a function of x, you will find that it will be a flat like this y can actually be represented by the column space of x, but usually due to noise and the fact that our models are sort of a simplification of the actual system, um, they probably will not be an exact relationship. Um, but this is sort of a geometric way to interpret what linear regression or least squares linear regression is trying to do. And another useful way to think about this is that this also comes from assuming that y is some function of x with some Gaussian noise added to it. And this is this the, um, the likelihood function for a normal distribution. So the likelihood and probability of y comes from this. And basically, there are two parameters here that are sort of important. The mu, actually, I should just point with this. Um, the mu and the sigma, so this is mean and variance, and you're probably used to seeing that in some sense. And that sort of changes the shape of your normal distribution, uh, how likely a particular y value would be. Um, so we'll come back to this, but this is just you to know this is the general form of a normal. Um, yeah, and so what this sort of amounts to, and I say y equals mx plus b here, but you can treat that like x beta, some y is some function of x. What that sort of means is that you think y uh, comes from mx plus b or x beta and is perturbed by some Gaussian noise away from that line. Um, so then you can describe the likelihood of y, whatever your observation is, in terms of a normal distribution where this mx, this function of x is the mean, y is some observation um, some distance away from that. And the, so then if you have you know, many y's for each x, whatever your x is, each cell, um, then the likelihood over all of those is going to be the multiplication of their likelihoods. That's just a, literally a multiplication for each y of that f of y. Um, and what you would then want to do um, is find um, the m and b coefficients, or beta, whatever the, the terminology is, that maximizes this likelihood. And I've written it as a minimization at the end. It's, that's just the negation of a maximization. It's essentially the same thing. Um, but you can take this likelihood, and basically what you get is that you would want to optimize this difference, which is the exact same as the least squares optimization problem. So what that tells you is that linear regression is sort of, this is sort of making the same assumptions that your data comes from a Gaussian error noise model. Um, and the other important assumption that it makes is of, a, I say homosedacity. I've heard people say homos, I don't know. Homosedacity is what I'm going to say. Um, and the point is that it assumes that the variance is the same for all points. And you can sort of see that actually even in this equation, right? The sigma is the same for all for all y. It doesn't matter how large or small that value was. But that actually might not be true for your data. This is something that's important. Um, there are other ways and methods of dealing with data with uh, heterostedacity is what the other option would be. And you can sort of see this here, where the relationship of x and y, sort of the distribution or noise about that line is sort of the same. Whereas here, it's greater with larger y's and less with um, uh, smaller wise. And there are different ways of dealing with this. We'll talk about one of them, which is normalizing your data, um, uh, st doing a variance stabilization transform, if you have heard of those. Um, and so one of the activities is basically to, we will derive that um, the best linear unbiased estimator is this formulation that we talked about here, this x transpose x. Um, given your x data matrix, um, but that will be for one of the um, exercises. Um, yeah, and so this is something that's important to pay attention to. You can also look at this if you fit a linear regression model. You can look at the errors or what's called the residuals from the y values your model predicts. And if those errors are sort of evenly or randomly distributed, 
then um, you may have to worry about this problem less. But if you sort of see that it is a trend given this, the, the magnitude, et cetera, of the y value, um, then maybe you're dealing with um, data that actually has heterostasticity. OK, so then this is just an example of how people use it in single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and this is common for inferring gene regulatory networks, so how some set of genes let's say X, uh, influence the expression of other genes. So maybe you have genes that are transcription factors. They turn on a bunch of other genes. You want to see which ones uh, control the expression of some other genes. So your Y would be expression of the, the other genes, and the X would be expression of the transcription factors or something. And then beta is your coefficient, basically the sort of magnitude of that, um, the influence of those Xs. And so somebody would fit a model like this. But um, if you want to use a model where, for example, the y is like a categorical, it's like your y is 0 or 1. So as a neuroscience example, maybe is the cell uh, GABAergic or not, or glutamatergic, if that's your not. Um, so you can translate that to a numerical value. So y is 0 or 1. Um, and so in that case, you may want to use something like a logistic regression model. And what the logistic function does, which is this curve that's shown here, is given some value. It gives you an output between 0 and 1, so sort of like a, a probability value. This is where it's commonly used. Um, and so what we do instead is that this linear relationship we're trying to learn, like in the regression uh, model, is inside the logistic function. So you have some function of x. And so x is, again, let's say this is the gene expression of your, this is just the gene expression of a cell. Um, this is like the probability given that gene expression that y is 1, that it is GABAergic. Let's just say that's the interpretation. And this is given by some function of x that you're trying to learn. You're trying to learn those betas um, in this case. Where is the next slide? Oh, OK. So then what we can do is treat the, so um, let's say y is, yeah, it's 1 for if a cell is GABAergic. It's 0 if it's glutamatergic, something like this. So this is using the Bernoulli, Bernoulli distribution now, which the binomial was sort of an extension on, um, so a simpler model, I guess, if you will. And so h of x here is the probability. Um, that y is, is 1, is GABAergic, uh, to the power of y. So when y is 1, it will be p. And then 1 minus that p is that it's glutamatergic or that it's 0. So 1 minus, uh, if y was 1, then they would just be 0. That would go away. Um, and if it's 0, then that term would stay. And what's nice is that this h of x is basically what I just described on the previous slide which was this probability of y being 1 given some x. And so this equation that you're trying to optimize, this likelihood, is basically going to be the p of x, p to the y, uh, times 1 minus p to the 1 minus i for each of those cells and their observations, or whatever the points are in your system. Um, yeah, and so this is an example where you're learning a relationship between a categorical variable and possibly continuous values, whatever it is that your x is. Um, and this is something we actually will do an example of in the notebooks um, for this example of trying to learn which genes and their expression in this case contribute the most or have the highest sort of magnitude weights in predicting one cell type versus the other cell types. And so this is something that's a very common um, very common technique. There's also extensions to non-binary, um, like multi-class regression and these sorts of things, which I won't talk about. But um, this is very common if you have categorical data on one end and want to predict them. OK. So let's see. There are other relationships between x and y that we can look at. And I think for a lot of 
the things that I'm talking about also, there is a limitation that a lot of them look at only linear relationships, and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, and some of these, the so covariance and correlation, which I'm going to talk about, also might be useful for some of the upcoming lectures, I think, particularly related to causal modeling and building from correlations. Um, but covariance is essentially looking at, again, the relationship between x and y and how the change in one basically affects or grows with the change in another. Um, and this is the equation. You will be working with this a little bit in one of the exercises. Um, and so what is interesting about this is that this metric does change with the scale of x and y. And so another metric, which is probably very common to a lot of people, is correlation. And this is particularly Pearson's correlation. And what is this is is essentially a scaled covariance, um, scaled by the, the standard deviations, I guess, in this case, of both x and y. Um, and this sort of ranges between negative 1 to 1. And it's sort of how um, the x and y are related to each other in a linear fashion. So again, if you have like x equals y squared or something like that, then you don't want to be using something like Pearson's correlation. You might want to use something like, um, I don't know, Spearman's correlation or something that's based on something else like the rank. Or you want to see if there are two points are monotonically changing with each other, but not necessarily in a linear fashion. So there are definitely limitations with using correlation. Um, again, also correlation does not equal causation, which I'm sure you also will hear about. Um, yeah, and so though it is a very powerful um, metric to use in various ways. And so one example um, that I think is kind of a cool extension of this correlation is partial correlation. Um, and what this means is that you want to know the relationship between two variables. And I think we have between b and c, but there is a some other variable that we want to account for in this correlation. Um, so like, for example, maybe you want the relationship between education and income, but you want to essentially regress out the effects of age, something like this. Um, and so essentially, all of this is doing partial correlation. What it is doing is doing a regression of b against a and c against a, and then taking the residuals of that model, sort of effectively what is not explained, and then doing a sort of correlation between um, C and B, the residuals of those um, regressions. And you also get to play with this um, in the exercises. And so this is just uh, literally what it ends up looking like uh, if you wanted to calculate the partial correlation of B and C against A. Um, yeah, and this also is sort of a useful concept for doing what's called sort of conditional independence statistics, where you sort of look at, are these two variables independent or dependent in the context of another variable? And again, this becomes really important when you're trying to do causal inference of things and uh, inference of sort of directionality of the impact of one variable on the others. And so this is a pretty interesting um, technique. Oh, and yes, you can also extend it to multiple other uh, variables that you want to sort of regress out or regress against. And so that's a nice, um, by doing very, a very similar procedure to what I described with the two regressions. OK, so, um, oh yeah, so this was from the first slide. But I sort of talked about some very fundamental principles of things that we uh, look at in, in single cell data and a lot of biological data examples. And now what I'm going to talk about is more specifically modeling single cell data, but with the focus on like which features are sort of driving how we choose the models that represent these data sets um, and how that leads us to conclude how we should be pre-processing the data, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So I'm just talking about basically the gene expression count matrix now. Yeah, so actually this relates to something I was talking about before, and this is actually from Long Kai, well, this is, this is an experiment, uh, this is Long Kai's paper from the early 2000s. Um, and so single cell data is really interesting. It's very, 
very sparse. You have a lot of zero counts, so cells will like not have counts of genes. Um, there's a lot of noise. Um, you're also having to deal with the fact that everything is an approximation. Um, and we'll talk about the UMIs briefly. Um, and there are a lot of sources from a biological perspective of extrinsic and intrinsic noise. And so one example of the more intrinsic noises, so this is the production of a beta galactosidase, I think, molecule over time. And they were using fluorescence readouts to, to get this plot. And essentially what you see is that there's like long periods of time where there's no production and what we call a burst of production of a bunch of molecules and then no production and a burst. And what's interesting is actually those bursts, how many molecules are produced follow a geometric distribu distribution. And this is a really popular distribution that is used in our field, but this was sort of seminal paper about um, the sort of noisiness of production of mRNA in each cell. So each cell itself has sort of this intrinsic stochasticity. And then you also have differences between cell types, and there's many other sort of sources of differences of production of a gene, or production of mRNA in this case. Um, yeah. So this gene count matrix is, as we were talking about before, non-negative integers. So you will have for a cell 0, 1, 2, some number of counts for each gene. Um, this does come, I mean, not from a literal count of the molecules in the cell, but more from aligning the sequences, as you were talking about, um, of the mRNA to some reference, some reference transcriptome, and then counting how many of those, the, the sequences in that reference are being mapped to. Um, so that's what those counts represent. And um, yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about what UMIs are in the next slide. And there are, a lot, there are a few distributions that are very commonly used to represent count data. And you see in the binomial in Poisson, and I will talk a bit about the negative binomial and why we think that it is useful in this field. Um, so when we were talking about proxy counts and what's actually happening here, what is happening here is that you had, let's say, transcripts A and B in the cell. And let's say in the cell, they were literally three molecules of each. So same, same amount, essentially. And you had these UMIs, which are oligos that all are, all are unique from each other. And so they sh one will bind to each molecule. Again, this is based on sort of the probability of unique binding. And so each has a unique tag. Then to do the sequencing, et cetera, you have to do a bunch of amplifications, PCR amplifications. You have to convert it to cDNA. This introduces a lot of biases. Some sequences get amplified more than others. There's a lot of things here. But what's nice is if you have these UMIs, you can collapse them back to sort of the original counts. Um, and what that means is, yeah, there's four of them, these blue ones here, but they all come from the same UMI. So you collapse that down to the one molecule it came from. Um, and you need this amplification to be able to do the sequencing and get, and get readout, but you can collapse it back to sort of what it was post the PCR um, amplification. So then you get back that there was about three of each. Although again, it's not as clean of this as in terms of literally mimicking exactly how many are in each cell, but in terms of what was captured, this is why we do the UMI um, correction so we can get what was actually captured. Um, so those are the counts that we're working with. Okay. So these are the, oh, yeah. Based on the of how do you, oh, where did I say that? Oh, um, yes, so that depends. So some, there is a normalization method, like a count normalization method for that, so where you do uh, normalize by the literal length of the transcript. There are other ways to um, model this. So if a gene is long, oh well, um, it also doesn't, so I mean you can model that as well, but I think if people do that, it is just, basically normalizing for the length of the transcript uh, in terms of its counts. So like trying to bring everything to the same level. And I'll talk about an example of that. But actually, 
because on each bead you have so many oligos that like it sort of saturates the, the system, um, it doesn't end up being too much of a worry basically that you're only capturing really long. Um, yeah, and because basically the bias is more towards capturing poly A uh, because that UMI is actually attached to a poly T. So it captures poly adenylated mRNA. So there are, so there's some work and there's some work in our lab doing this to model that bias. The fact that if you have a longer gene, you may have more internal polyase. So you may actually bind to the UMIs. You're more likely to bind. You're also more likely to bind to the UMI, maybe come off and bind to another one. So there's like possibly multiple sampling happening. Um, and so that's usually modeled more in the interaction between the, po the poly T and the poly A capturing rather because the UMI is just a sequence next to that, next to the poly A T. Um, so this diagram sort of leaves that out, but it's capturing these by the poly T and that's where bias is introduced. Um, yeah, but it's actually not, the, the, for a lot of these methods like 10X and stuff, it's actually not usually necessary to, to uh, normalize your counts by the length of the gene. Although it can be beneficial to model the capture with its poly A3 prime bias. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So there are a bunch of distributions that are really commonly used. Somebody else? Okay. Um, and we've seen some of these. I think I have the Bernoulli up here. Um, I also have a continuous one, which is the gamma distribution, and I'll talk about why that one is also used um, commonly, because it's, it's not actually for discrete events, but it is very useful actually for modeling discrete phenomena. Um, okay, so this is the Poisson distribution. We have seen this a few times now. And the point is that we're trying to model sort of the uh, number of events of something in some time interval, um, with lambda being that number of events per time interval, or average, the average. Um, and so here, you only have one parameter, which is lambda. And lambda is equal, the, is the mean, like the expected value. And it's also equal to its variance. So you really only have one parameter to play with in this distribution. The negative binomial, so it can be thought of as modeling the number of R failures uh, until some success. And there is some probability P of success. And again, how people would describe failure and success is completely like you can flip those depending on the system. Um, but we could think about it like success is a burst of gene expression stopping. So how many, the, the number of failures would actually be how many molecules are produced before it ends. Um, but what ends up actually being a better way to think about this and how we end up using it in this field is um, that the negative binomial is actually uh, can be derived essentially from a Poisson, but in Poisson where that rate, that average rate actually comes from a distribution. So it basically allows for more noise in that rate. Um, yeah, and this sort of means that you have a, something with the distribution where the mean and variance don't have like a one-to-one -one relationship. Maybe there's a greater variance than the mean. And I don't know if, uh, if people are still taking classes and stuff here, but in terms of modeling these sorts of, modeling like genetic circuits and that sort of thing, uh, there is a class taught by Justin Boyce and Michael Elowitz. Uh, it's BIBE 150. Um, and it talks a lot about this, where the negative binomial comes from, uh, in general, just how to model variability in gene expression. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. So interesting class. Um, so. What we see in single cell data is that the mean of some gene and its variance, so let's say like a gene is expressed across some cells, you take the mean and the variance, uh, you get this relationship where the variance is like a function of the mean squared, essentially. You can see this here. So V equals mu plus some dispersion factor, we usually call it, times mu squared. And so you don't get a nice Poisson relationship where mean and Lambda, uh, the variance and mean are one-to-one, -one, but you get sort of a, something where the variance actually 
increases with the mean. And so this is why people started using the negative binomial to model this, um, this data. So then, given what we talked about with regression, logistical regression, assumptions in all these methods, um, when we come to doing analysis of these methods, um, what assumptions actually make sense, which analysis methods make sense, and then how would you process the data to possibly make them work with these techniques? And so that's what I will describe, at least how we do this in this field. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that people normalize and adjust their count data and, as an example, make them continuous. Um, one is because a lot of methods, and we talked about this with regression, assume uh, equal variance. So just because something is, has a higher value, um, it's assuming that the variance is still the same for all of these, which, as we just showed with the data, is actually not the case. Um, and a lot of the clustering methods, et cetera, use like sort of distances and Euclidean distance between um, these different points, which also make different assumptions about uh, the variance or equal variance, this sort of thing, um, and can be disrupted if you basically don't control for the fact that just because something is highly expressed, it might have higher variance, but you don't actually want to call it a more variable thing. Um, so anyways. And so there's a technique called variance stabilization, and the idea is that you have some data, and there is some trans and you think that data comes from some distribution. And there is some transformation that you can do to the data to sort of separate the relationship between the mean and the variance and make these more one-to-one -one comparisons. And for the negative binomial, it turns out you can essentially log the data and add what is referred to as sort of a pseudo count, like a small value. Um, and what this will do is basically separate uh, the mean and variance relationship. And I don't show the derivation of this here, but um, anyways. And so this is why if you do anything in this field, you'll see people doing a lot of transformations, like a log 1p times their data, times their gene expression matrix. And um, though we people may not know it, this is actually where it sort of comes from. So it actually makes sense if your data, you think it's negatively binomially distributed, and you want to use a method that requires that the variance is the same between all things, this transformation makes sense for that type of count data. And you'll get to play around with different transformations and see how well they work or don't work. Um, yeah, although the common methods do log 1p, which is log x plus 1. And the 1 is a little bit more ad hoc. I think it comes more from the fact that you don't want to take a log of 0 if there's no 0 counts. So there's a little bit of uh, tension in how we do that. Um, yeah. And so we were just talking about actually the length of a transcript, but there are other normalizations that people do to make cells comparable to each other, to make these features comparable. And one is called, um, uh, it's called a size factor, a library size factor. It's a little bit sort of ill-named. But the idea is that some cells might just have many more reads that came from them. And so you sort of want to scale up the other cells so that you can actually compare relative abundances of genes. And it's not just, oh, these were lower overall, but you want to compare, like, are they still expressing the same genes in the same ratio? So um, what that transformation looks like is very simple. Essentially, you take the for each of the rows in your matrix, for each of the cells, you sort of take its total read count, the sum of it, and then scale uh, all the other cells and then read counts up to the maximum one. And so in this way, if, when doing this, a lot of RNA-seq analysis is really comparing relative abundances between genes rather than uh, exact counts, basically. Well, so it's less, it's less different genes and more that like cells themselves. So like you might just have, uh, okay, well, you might just have, and exactly why is a great question. 
that is being investigated. But um, let's say you have cell one, and for all the genes, it just has like, you know, a lot of counts. This is a lot of counts. And then C2 has like lower counts for all genes in general. It just has lower reads that came from it. So that could be biologically interesting. However, the sort of standard, if you want to compare like, are these cells expressing more of this gene than that gene, then what people will do is basically scale this lower expression thing up to the same total as this, and then compare, like, is there more of this to this, basically relative gene comparisons. So if that's what you're interested in, then a scaling like this is fine. Um, but again, it will matter on the, uh, the application because um, sometimes that can destroy relationships that you're actually looking for. Like, why were these such a low abundance? cells or something like that. Um, yeah. OK, wait, I actually think this is all the slides. So this was a very short methods lecture because I didn't want to overwhelm um, or to go into the, the, the analysis time and the exercise time. So basically, this is what we went through. This is what the exercises will be on. Um, and so the manual exercises will touch on both regression and partial correlation. And then the notebook exercises will deal with the distributions and like dealing with the counts, as well as practical examples of how to use regression and um, partial correlation to look at relationships between genes or between uh, genes and some phenotype of interest or a cell type or trying to predict something like that. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any more questions from the methods part. How much time? Okay. Cool. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's that was a more just to connect it to a thing you will probably hear about later, but it's sort of related to calculating what are called conditional independence statistics, and that's like the probability of A and B conditional on C, and you can use those relationships and determining if A and B actually are independent or dependent given a third variable to order sort of how C is related to A and B. And this is really common in gene network inference. So G, uh, uh, gene C impacts A and B, but, not, but A and B are not related to each other. So you can build sort of a graph of uh, interactions, this sort of thing. So it's related to that concept. Um, yeah. OK. So. Let's see, what do we have in the exercises? OK. So if we go to, so maybe we'll do the handwritten exercises for a little bit, and I'll go over some. Um, and then if people want to keep working on it, they can. But then we will switch to the notebooks, um, something like that. Um, yes, OK, so we'll p try to do the same. I guess we could just, yeah, OK, we can just start the hands-on session. Um, we're trying to do the same thing, where sort of work with the one or two, depending on the proximity, people next to you. Um, and we can start with exercise two. Um, yeah, because the previous one was all distance calculations. And this is sort of demonstrating how you get what is sort of the classical way of solving the least squares linear regression problem. Um, and there is something on the cheat sheet that I will show, and I'll put it up here that will be useful. Um, and if you find the matrix stuff too much and or not interesting, um, I will go over. But we, you can also start on exercise three, which is playing around with how to actually calculate partial correlation between variables. Yeah. But yeah, so I would work with neighbors on that. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs>
So on the, actually, I forgot about the cheat sheet. So this may come in handy for exercise two, which is just, this is how you take a derivative of a matrix um, product. And I just wanted to write it out here. That way you can sort of plug in these. So this is like the derivative of the magnitude of something, something x squared comes out to be this. And if you take the derivative of some matrix variable x times something else, that other thing comes out as a constant, sort of how you'd normally take a derivative. So like derivative of 3x is 3. Like that. So these will be useful to sort of plug in to get the solution that is uh, the least squared estimator 